We're starting. Okay. I'm going to trust that this is working because it's hard to verify. It says Google Hangouts is sharing your screen. Okay. I guess everybody's here. Um, okay, so that's a finger tree. Um, looks kind of weird. Um, where's the page down? Do you have a page down? Uh, no, I don't have a page down. I don't know. Oh, great. Well, maybe it's I just didn't idea. discover it. All right, well, I'll use the next button. Cause, cause, <laughs> um, okay, who am I? So I'm Bill Burdick. Uh, my friend Roy and I started messing around doing projects in about 1988. Uh, and we called ourselves Team Cthulhu. Uh, and so right now our current project is called Leisure, which is uh, it's a dynamic polyglot computing environment. It runs in your browser. Um, and it also comes with its own language, which is um, comes off the untyped Lambda calculus, so it's it's kind of like uh, Haskell, only uh, without the types. So don't laugh. <laughs> uh, it's like the Lisp version of Haskell. So it's or you can think of it as a lazy Lisp, um, but more Lambda calculusy than Lisp. Um, uh, but uh, the environment has, uh, it supports CoffeeScript and JavaScript and Lispy script, which is a little known version of Lisp. Um, Closure script coming soon. Um, okay, so back to finger trees, a weird name. What is it? Uh, normally you don't access finger trees uh, directly, the insides of them. Normally you deal with finger trees in bulk. So you can you can uh, add to them, you can remove to them, you can split them and concatenate them. You don't normally access the innards except by splitting. But just so you know why it's called a finger tree, um, this, this node here is called a finger. Um, these circle nodes are fingers. And each finger has a left, a right, and a middle. Um, the left side is like the beginning and the right side is like the end and the middle is the middle. Um, and it points to another finger. So the middle of this finger is, yeah, this part, uh, the whole rest of the tree. Um, so if you first, uh, I stole these pictures from different places. This picture is from the finger tree paper written by um, Heinz and Patterson. Uh, so if you, if you start with this tree, and then you fold it in half along the spine, so it, it's really just the same tree folded. Um, that's almost a finger tree. And you just add these finger nodes here, and then you've got a, you've got a finger tree. So the fingers give you a way to uh, access pieces of successive chunks of the tree. Um, trees? Um, so originally, well, we'll get into the history of them later, but they, they were originally proposed in 1977. Um, as an alternative list structure, an alternative to list lists that offered a lot better performance in a lot of situations than, than cons lists. Um, you can't really beat a cons list when it comes to just prepending to the list, but if, if you want to do more than that, um, then you get into bad performance. So, um, But the main, the main advantages of finger trees are decent performance, they're persistent, like list lists, um, and they're pluggable. Persistent, uh, it, 
well, I think I talk about this later in the talk, but the persistent means basically that the data structure is immutable. Um, and so you can share it um, and you can, you can build new data structures that reuse chunks of it safely because it's immutable. Um, so, eh, screen size is different. Um, decent performance in this sense means uh, you've got random access. Um, so you've got decent performance for these operations. You can push at both ends and pop at both ends and reverse at order one. Um, if you've got a lazy implementation, there's various ways you can get order one for reversing a, a finger tree. Some implementations, it's order n, but um, insert and delete are log n, and splitting the tree into two other trees is also log n. It's based on a test function, which I misspelled there. Um, and you can concatenate two of the trees with log n. Is the L1 uh, well, push and push and pop are. Um, I don't remember if it's amortized or not. Uh, it is a lazy. It normally, if you if you implement a lazy data structure, then a lot of the goodness of this comes from the laziness. So, go ahead. You can definitely get heavy. Yeah. Okay. And the function we can use is can you use n function or just monotonic functions? Uh, you can use a function of one argument that returns true or false based on the measure, um, which we'll get into that later. You can't stick any old function in there. Can't stick a five argument function in there because it only takes one argument. Um, monotonic, really, uh, if you know what you're doing, it doesn't have to be. Um, I mean, if, which you should know what you're doing because normally, um, if, if you're, I mean, if you created the finger tree, then you provided the measure. Right, and so then you should be able to provide. So you can actually, you can do interesting things with finger trees if you know what you're doing that kind of violate the, how the measures work. So, but we can talk about that later. Um, so, catenating trees is kind of a weird concept. At least it seemed kind of weird to me because normally if you think about if I've got, you know, a binary search tree and another one, catenating them doesn't necessarily make sense, because what if they overlap the values, you know? Or what if you switch the positions of the trees and you catenate them? What does that mean? Um, but uh, we're not really talking about search trees, because finger trees are usually used for to represent sequences, where the, you know, the order of the items is just like chronological. It's however you, you know, the order of the sequence. Um, so in that sense, it makes sense to catenate trees. Um, so you can use them like lists, like list lists or like closure vectors, um, which are also trees. So there are random access sequences um, that just happen to be implemented as trees, or vice versa, trees that you just happen to use to implement sequences. Um, and the bulk operations perform really well. And so split and concat for, you know, for vectors, even closure vectors, which was surprising to me, um, takes order n. Um, I thought closure vectors would be, would like append better than that, but they don't. It's when you append to, if you conj two closure vectors, it takes order n, um, which is covered here. So, and concatenating two finger trees, that's going to be log n, which is, Pretty nice. Um, oops. So this just shows you what happens when you when you take two list lists and you append them. You know, it copies 
the whole first list there. Um, closure vectors are going to do similar things, but kind of in inverse. Um, now with finger trees, just get ready to feel the performance. Okay, so this is roughly what happens. It's not exactly what happens, but you can see, you know, you just create new fingers and, and wire them up. You can get giant subtrees here. Um, and of course, you know, you've got exponential behavior down here, so like the deeper you go into the finger tree, the bushier the trees get because you're folding that tree in half like that. Um, so that's roughly what happens. Um, there's a lot more finagling and laziness and rearrangement that goes on, but that's roughly it. Um, but it's, it is really log, log n, and uh, of course that makes a big difference for big trees, big lists. So you can catenate two lists of a million items. Um, I mean, you normally wouldn't think of sticking a million or ten million items into a lisp list, right? I mean, because you're gonna, it's just order n. Um, but with finger trees, it's actually practical to do that, and um, I actually do. In, in Leisure, I use finger trees all over the place for, for lots of stuff. Um, so split gives you random access, and it, and it seems wasteful in finger trees because um, a split essentially gives you two extra trees. You've got this one big giant tree, and you split it, you get two two finger trees as the result. Um, so what you do is you provided a you provided a function, a test function, and it and the first tree is all the first items that failed the test. And then the second tree is all the rest, starting with the first one that succeeded in the test. So that's why I said it doesn't have to be monotonic. As long as you know that, you know, it's trusting you that all the ones after that one are going to also succeed in the test, but they don't have to, if you know what you're doing. Um, and so, of course, you've got these two, these two finger trees back, and you can randomly access and alter each one if you want. Um, so, and that is how you write insert or delete. You just split, and then you push or pop one of the trees, and then you concatenate them back. And that's how you that's how you do uh, insert and delete. Um, if you've written your own collection libraries, which I have, and well, in the past, and I really don't like to, because they have to perform perfectly. Um, delete's easy here, because all you do is you just split it remove the first item or the last item of one of the trees, and then you concatenate them back, and it works. You don't have to really worry about it. Um, if you've written your own collection libraries, you understand the fear and loathing that comes from delete, from especially from like AVL trees and things like that. They're just nasty. Um, what's that? Yeah. There are some nice data structures out there. Um, so I covered this a little bit, why why persistent is neat. I, I, I know some of the people in the room understand about the value of immutable data structures and persistent, but I'm not sure if everybody does. Um, they're functional, so you got, you know, the buzzword, compliance. Um, old collection values don't change. Uh, so that means that you can safely have a pointer to them and not worry that some other thread is going to modify the data structure out from under, from under you. Um, so that means that it's great for uh, concurrent and asynchronous stuff. Um, and it works well in functional environments, but also any, you know, any asynchronous environment, they work great. So disclaimer. Finger trees are three to five times slower than the best balanced binary search trees. Um, according to the original paper that introduced them, and well, not the original, but the modern version of finger trees 
were introduced in 2006. Um, so why would you use these? Maybe you need a tree that isn't just for search. Or maybe you need a search tree, but you don't happen to have one lying around that can fit your exact needs. I'll show you some of the cool things you can do with them. You can have plausible. Um, it's a Swiss Army knife. They're great for ad hoc measured sequences. Um, a lot of people just use lists and vectors or maps or whatever for them. Um, but they have some properties that are better than lists for random access or maps. They're still sequential. Um, and they have better performance than any of these one, you know, things if you need a bunch of the, the operations combined together. Um, so what it means by measured sequence is that finger trees keep measurements that are cascaded through the structure uh, to help you with searching. Um, and it, it caches each it caches the measurements at each layer of the structure. Um, so if you've got a tree like this, it gives you login because it's it's a two three tree. Um, the measurements go there. So as opposed to what normally you might use for a two three tree, which maybe you noticed, all the data is at the leaves here, just like in a list list. So the internal nodes aren't used to store the data. They're used to store just the measurements. Um, so if you've got a finger tree, what are you going to use it for? Or actually, how do you use it? Um, you provide uh, an object that tells it how to, that tells the tree how to measure an element, which produces a value. It's a measurement. It could be any value. It could be an integer or whatever. Um, you have to give it an identity function, which gives it the zero measurement, and you have to give it a sum, um, which takes two measures, two measurements, and produces a, th a third measurement based on the other two. And these make it uh, a monoid. Um, we'll talk about that later. So given a measurement test function, it returns two finger trees when you split it. So how it's split. Um, so I think we said earlier, the first tree that it returns is going to be the initial items that don't pass the test. And the rest is going to be the first one plus everything else. Uh, and you provide that measurement function at creation. These are the these parts here. Sorry if this part's dry. I'm getting into an example that's more concrete. Um, so each finger tree has a specialized way to access it. Um, so let's define a couple of them. Um, we'll look at one that lets you get the nth element. So this would be kind of like a lisp list except a random access. And then we'll talk about ropes, um, which is kind of a modern implementation of strings. Um, and then a finger tree that combines the two random access on an on the nth string plus get the string for the nth character. Um, so this is sort of like a, a finger tree that implements a list list. The measurement um, <coughs> measuring an item just always returns one and the sum just <coughs> adds the two measurements together. So if you look here, the measurement of this t returns 1. Each of the leaves measure to just 1. And combining them just adds them together. So you've got 2 here. It's just going to be the number of leaves. Um, 2, 2, 2, and that adds up to 6. Um, and so the get nth function, which is going to get me the nth item in the list, uh, is just defined as splitting on n greater than i. Um, that's where i is the input. So if I say, you know, get me the third, it's going to split on n greater than 3. Does that make sense? Am I going too slow or too fast? In this case, we'll, we'll just split like this. 
so if I so let's say I just say get nth with um, two. Okay, so it's going to check that n is greater than two. So um, n here is going to be one, two, right? So it's going to that's going to fail for these two items, right? Um, so, but it's going to succeed here. So it's going to give me back two trees, one which contains these two uh, items and one which contains all the rest. Does that make sense? So what you're saying is that really passing some kind of test on each node, you split the, you split the tree on the first occurrences of the Failing function or either true or false, it doesn't matter. Assuming something that you can somehow you assume that there's a monotonic um, that the function is monotonic over the entire thing, right? So you actually speak in the first occurrences of the function that either fail or true. Or false. Right, it helps if it's monotonic. Um, but so, like for instance, you know, so it, it, this is why it caches it all the way up into the tree. So, you know. It succeeds here, right? 14 is greater than 2. And here, 6 is greater than 2. 2 is not greater than 2. So it can go, it can do log n to find the subtree that fails the test. You may want to check or, or, or you need to check the entire tree. No, it doesn't need to check the entire tree. No, it doesn't because, because it's one time. So the first time I find that it's you know failing or passing, whatever. Then I know that I don't need to check the rest, right? Because of that. So actually, it doesn't because what you have in the internal nodes are not value of this measure function. They are um, sums of this measure function, graphic sums to be right? and these sums are monotonous. So the function itself is not necessarily monotonous, but you need the um, the property is that if you compute larger and larger sums using the sum provided there, this is monotony. And this allows you to search. Yeah. Is it the same idea as in Merkle trees? I don't know about Merkle trees. I've, I haven't looked at them, so I can't answer that. Um, Okay, so if we look here, I just copied down the, the definition of, of uh, the measurement here. But it, um, so T is going to be um, a finger tree from this array, and I just give it a string from A to Z. Um, you know, then if I pass 0, I'm going to get A. Um, you can see it's goes around. So of course negative two the negatives are still gonna give A because of the way I defined good N. Um question? Okay, so if, let's take a look at ropes. Um ropes are a modern approach to strings. They're used by JavaScript and some other systems. Unfortunately, not by Java. Um, Java strings are just arrays of characters, um, which I refer to as Java's FUDIY approach, which means do it yourself. Um, before Java 7, substring was order 1. But Java 7 and over substring is order n because they realized um, Leaks. Uh, at least that's what I think. I'm, I didn't actually read why, but I'm pretty sure it's because links. Um, previous one, yeah. In, yeah. Yeah, which that's not going to work very well in the long run. Um, Potentially, I mean, you could get pathological cases, which I'm sure if you're writing compilers or web you know, processing web requests, you probably had nasty stuff going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
Um, catenating is also time n for strings. In JavaScript, you don't have this problem because, um, you know, because web. I mean, you can't, you can't very well have long-running JavaScript programs that, that work on huge web pages with these kinds of uh, properties. So ropes give you log n for substring and catenation, which correspond to split and catenation. Um, so this is how you define uh, ropes with finger trees. So it's almost the same except the measure is length instead of one. Other than that, it's identical. Um, identity is still zero, sum is still a plus b, but, but measuring a node gives you the length instead of just the number one. Um, the string at position is a little more complicated, um, but uh, you can see what the tree looks like here. We've got, you know, the only difference is that these numbers up here are just the sums of the lengths of the leaves instead of just the sums of the number of leaves. So, so just the number of leaves. Um, so if you look at this, then you can just play around with this value. You can see, you know, um, well, I guess I didn't give the context, but uh, if you look back here, we've got A, 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 B, 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 C, 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 B, B. Um, so uh, I'm just getting the, uh, the nth string and then <coughs> the string at that character position, and then I'm just doing this, the, the string up to that. Does that make sense? I'm guessing yes. Uh, okay, so what about doing both at once? What about being able to get... Um, now this is a little contrived because it doesn't make sense necessarily. Do I want the nth sub substring of a rope? But combining multiple operations comes in later. You'll see where it actually has a use, a, a good use. But since these were the two examples I had, I thought I'd just combine them. So I want to be able to get the nth string, you know, like the third substring, or I want to be able to get the string at character position n or m. Um, so the measure, instead of being a number, is an object or a map. So it's got the count, uh, uh, which is one from the pre the first definition, and the and the length. And identity is defined as a combination of both. And uh, the sums are the sums of counts and lengths. Um, and then I just defined get nth2 and string at position 2, um, similarly to the first one, except you know, I'm, using, uh, <coughs> I'm using the property of the object here, count or length like that. Um, we can test it here. Uh, this is the fifth substring, sixth, ninth. Um, and then you can see here this is like this. I got the whole subs the whole string up to that character position. So okay, so here we've got like a dual purpose tree. It's kind of neat. To enable like each function, you add another measure. You have both measures. Uh, you know. yeah, you combine when you build it, you just... combine the measures together. Yeah, so that they like unify the measures. Um, so you you've got to you some kind of like agree with one another, right? Can't they? Uh, so well, no. I mean. They have to be about the um, individual elements, but as long as they work, it should be fine, right? I mean, as long as they're about the individual elements, they're both measures of the same elements. If you just, you can, seems to me, you could just pile on as many properties as you want. It's the function that you pass in for split that's going to choose, you know, 
based on the property that it's interested in and the measure. So I don't think there necessarily has to be any agreement. And you'll see later on, I'm, I'm going to show a, a very weird example later. You can use, like, in the same function, you can use two measurements? Yeah, well, it's one measurement, but it just has, you know, it's an it's aggregate value. I mean, you're always picking a particular measurement, but each measurement is an aggregate. Um, so, so this is kind of a weird idea, I think. I mean, to me, it was weird. Um, so, you know, measurements can be complex. They can serve <coughs> several purposes, and they can act like multiple in, uh, indices on the same tree. Um, why would you want to do that? Let's talk about good performance. So we talked about, we just to review, you got um, log in, split, concat, insert, delete, and order one, push, pop, and reverse. Um, this is from another guy's finger, to finger tree talk that I've, I've got a link to it, at the QR codes at the bottom and stuff. Um, and so he compares the, uh, the order that um, the performance of finger trees, annotated two, three trees, lists, and vectors. Um, and vector, I'm not sure who's vector. I'm not sure if that's closure vector or if that's, say, C++ vector. But, um, Split is order one, so I'm guessing it's a closure vector. Um, I'm not sure. Oh no, maybe that's maybe split is like uh, like a Java substring split operation. I'm not sure. Um, anyway, so interesting thing here is does he have reverse? Yeah, reverse here he has is order. Order n basically, so he's not using the lazy implementation. I don't think for that. Um, so this just compares it to other data structures. So you can look at this later on if you want. Um, who uses it? Uh, the ye. I don't know how to pronounce that. Ye. <coughs> yi instead of vi maybe. Um, it's the it's an Emacs like editor written in Haskell. Um, uses finger trees to implement text buffers, and uh, Leisure uses them. Um, I'm sure other systems use finger trees, but I haven't seen a lot. So it seems like they're not in common use yet. But they're you know it's a new data structure. <sighs> yeah, and they don't have any, they don't have I didn't see what they used them for, but I saw they included finger trees, but I didn't see. Oh, really? It's funny because they don't have a lazy implementation. So, like, they don't get some of the good performance that I'm touting here because they have a strict implementation, which you lose um, some of the benefits. So. Well, it's lazy. Okay, so, yeah. Um, so, uh, in this paper, um, finger tree is a simple general purpose data structure. They go over how to implement uh, a whole bunch of Okasaki's data structures from this functional data structures paper. Um, you might be able to implement all of them with finger trees, but not, I haven't tested that myself. So, um, so here's what I use them for. Um, Leisure uses them for the block index. The, and blocks are, it, it divides up the document into blocks. Um, so like every time you see a, this, this is using Leisure by the way, this, this presentation is in Leisure. Um, so this is like, this code block here is in a separate block. The meet, it's called a meet block in between. Um, and then there's another code block. So there's blocks just all over the place in Leisure. Um, and it uses 
finger trees for um, finding the ID of a block by the offset and finding the offset by the ID. So like if I go to 1,000 here, um, you can see it's finding different blocks here. Um, it uses it to implement floating marks, like Emacs's marks, which are just really you know, labels with an offset that move around when you edit the text. Um, and it uses finger trees to implement sets of textual replacements. Um, so if I, you know, if I got seventeen different replacements, I might just collect them into a into a replacements object that just represents replacements in a string. Oh. Uh, which it needs to use for collaboration. Um, so it uses one tree to convert both between character offset and ID and, and back. Um, so it's got a two-way a reverse mapping just together in the same tree, which is was kind of neat um, to to figure out how to do. Um, so we use uh, Facebook's immutable JS library to get a nice persistent set um, to record all the IDs. Um, and then and we also use a, a rope technique. Um, so oh yeah. Um, the IDs you can see here, I've got a set here for my, my measurement. For identity, uh, well, they, they have sets and uh, IDs and lengths. And IDs is a set, so we've got a set of IDs at each position, and it's going to grow as you get farther down the tree. Right. So um, it seems kind of kind of wasteful uh, because like that set, you know, larger and larger sets going on. But um, it's not too bad because persistent. Um, so here's what it kind of looks like. So I've got this, each item in the finger tree has a length and a set of IDs. Um, and so, you know, when we get to the fourth item, um, it's reusing the tree of the third item like that. And so as you, as you go farther down, you're going to get bigger and bigger sets, but no, the vast majority of items in the sets are actually reused from the previous ones. Um, this makes sense. And so what that does is that allows me to let's see if I have an example of nope floating marks. I thought I had. Uh, well, if I go back here. Um, you can see I, I can search for the block ID based on the offset, and then I can also um, search for the offset based on the ID, and that's using that structure. Okay. Um, so marks are just names and offsets, um, and I rely. I, Go ahead. Would you just need a free search for an ID you are actually performing a linear search to the disk? Good question. No. Uh, because every because every measurement contains a whole set of IDs of the successive IDs. How can one test if an ID is a set except by uh, that's right. Well because it's not a search to no, a set is. The set's a tree, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what I was trying to show here. These, these are supposed to be sets. But Facebook's um, immutable sets are their trees. Um, or two. To log in. This has to do, it just has to do two. Oh, to log in is log, oh, log n squared. Okay. Um, 
So floating marks, I, um, Leisure has to use floating marks to deal with uh, the value sliders. So I've been sliding these values around. Uh, let's see. When I'm like this guy here. Um, so he, this is using a floating mark. Um, the mark <coughs> it sticks a mark at the beginning of this number so that it can tell when it's changing the value. So it can tell where the number starts. Because when we're collaborating, someone else might be editing the text beforehand. And then if I'm just uh, if I'm in the middle of changing the value and someone else, you know, does a paste, then I might plot new value right in the middle of the text. So I need to use an, a floating mark to, to properly do that. Um, oops. So uh, the offset, so I say here that they're, they're names and offsets, but actually um, in the finger tree, the offset is stored relative to the previous mark. So it's a little less intuitive. Um, so it's really the distance to it's the distance from the previous mark to the current one, and this allows me to uh, easily insert and delete items inside and have them properly float. Um, and so, like if I if I delete a mark, I have to combine the two offsets together. For I have to add that mark's offset to the next to the next mark. Um, So, and then also I've got set, um, sets of textual replacements. Um, and those, uh, I use these for uh, operational trans to deal with part of the operational transformation that I'm using for collaboration. Um, I have to be able to uh, take editing operations and, and, well, I have to convert between the world of editing operations of, of textual replacement start and like, like a string replacement where I have a start and an end and a, and a replacement text. Um, sets of those, I have to convert between that and operational transformation, which has kind of a different way of thinking about things. Operational transformations um, think in terms of uh, retain, insert, and delete. Um, so it's, it's very important for getting collaboration right. Um, so the way I define uh, the textual replacement one is, um, let's see. Oh, I don't think I gave you the definition. Um, right, let me just. Well, I can't. No, I guess that one isn't going to work. Oh well. Um, so, one thing that's that's really easy to do with this with the finger tree, which I guess I didn't put the definition of, is that I can combine these two um, replacements together. So, you know, I start out with. Um, you know, replacing 5 to 15 with hello, and then replacing 3 to 7 with burp, and then it combines the two together. So um, this guy runs over and, and overlaps the H and the D, so it ends up with burp hello. Um, but I can't show that because I have an error, so I don't. Um, so that's pretty much it. Um, i got a few more things. It was first published in 1977. Uh, the original finger trees in 1977 did not have measurements. They were just that one type. They were just basically the measurement of one, where uh, it, it's just a random access list. Um, they, they've been refined over the years, but the major, I mean, in my opinion, the major improvement was in 2006 when they when they published the paper on measured finger trees, um, 
which Mike may, Patterson. what's that? It's Mike Patterson. Heinz and Patterson. Sorry, this font is harder to hard to read. That's no, the, the, oh, Mike. I don't don't remember his first name, but I got a link to the paper so you can read it. Um, and measurements are monoidal. Um, it mostly just means you can combine the measurements, but um, monoids are kind of like monads, um, and monads are like bananas and spacesuits. Um, you can read a lot of tutorials on them, and um, in my opinion, the reason people are really confused about monads is because they're because the I/O monad is a, is a clever hack. Um, it's a really interesting use of monads, but um, it's really what makes everyone confused from what, when I've talked to people. Um, it's a, well, topic for another talk. Um, the IO monad is, is it's, an, it's a common, it's an implementation of the command pattern using monads. It's very neat. Um, so um, mono, monoids uh, require a type for the items, an identity item, or a function that produces an identity item, and an associative operation, operation which is like a plus. Makes it an associative monad. Yeah. Ah, so there's non-associative monads too. Okay. Are they? If it's if it isn't associative, it isn't monad. I All right. Um, and the plus, the, the associative operation combines two items to make another one of the same type, basically. Um, that's it. Then there's, I've got some QR codes if anyone that's interested. Um, and I'll put the, I'm also published the um, link to this talk on the Meetup site. So if you don't want to use the QR codes, you can do that. That's it.